Hi everybody, my name is James Boston. I'm the founder of the Association of Former British Colonies. Um, the mission of the association is to examine the legacies of British colonization through educational content, social dialogue, um, and our aim is to inform global and UK policy around uh, reparations and decolonization. Um, to explore the legacies of British colonization in Jamaica, uh, specifically, um, I invited Stephen Golding uh, to conduct an interview with me, um, and I'm glad to say that Stephen has joined us. Uh, Stephen, would you mind telling uh, our listeners a bit about your, yourself and your background, please? Thank you, James. No problem. My name is Stephen Golding. Uh, I'm the president of the Universal Negro Improvement Association in Jamaica. For those who don't know, that was the confraternity founded by the right excellent Marcus Mosiah Garvey here in 1914, who later went on to become our first national hero. I'm also a member of the National Council on Reparation um, and have been since the elevation of the council from a commission to a council in 2016. And I've, you know, worn various hats over the years, once chairman of the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica. I'm still a member of the Institute of Jamaica. I'm a teacher by profession, a professor of Garveyism, um, husband, father, black man. <laughs> All right. Thank African. you very much. <laughs> And thank you very much for joining us. So what we're going to do, we're going to start at the basics um, and kind of go over the uh, basic history of, of Jamaica in relation to uh, the colonial history specifically. Um, and then we're going to explore themes like reparations and decolonization from the Jamaican perspective. Um, so we'll start at the beginning. Why did Britain colonize Jamaica? You know, as we learned the history in school, um, there was a British fleet on its way to uh, capture Cuba from from the Spaniards um, sometime early in the 17th century, early in the 1600s. And for whatever reason, whether the weather or whether the fact that the Spanish, Spanish garrison there was well enforced, um, they, the British had to turn back, but not wanting to leave empty handed, they sailed for Jamaica where they engaged a smaller Spanish garrison um, and lay siege to the island, which was formerly a, a Spanish colony from the early 16th century for almost 100 years, um, and then became a British colony after the battle at Rio Nueva and after the Spanish withdrew. Um, the British officially claimed this island in 1611. Of course, the name Jamaica comes from the, the Taino word um, Zamaka, which means land of wood and water. Um, and so we've been a, we were a British colony from um, the mid 1600s, right up until our independence in 1962. So we're talking some 300, 350 years of, of being a British colony. Okay, and how did uh, colonization, Spanish and British, impact the populations of Jamaica? So you just mentioned the, the indigenous population there. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as Taino, other times Arawak. Um, how yeah, did Ar Arawak was the language they spoke. For many mm -hmm. years we thought the people were called by the name of the language, but um, our historians and anthropologists have corrected us, I think, a couple of decades ago. Um, the indigenous people, of course, had many different tribes, amongst them the Tainos, um, one group which became known as the Carib. Um, but how colonization affected them, it decimated their population, decimated their population. In fact, as a result of that, um, which was a consequence of the Spanish trying to enslave them and with the usual diseases that Europeans bring to these tropical countries. Um, it was as a result of that decimation that it was decided that enslaved Africans would be trafficked and brought here um, to work on the plantations that Europe had established. And so 
you know, the effect of their colonization, you know, from the start was very negative, very negative. From the moment they met Christopher Columbus, as we said down here, Christopher Columbus, um, up until the invasion of the English and even subsequently up until our independence, um, there's been a negative impact, which you, which you must expect from the fact that for over three centuries, you know, Africans were kidnapped and trafficked here. You know, we talk about modern day slavery and the illegal trafficking of people nowadays. But think of the horrific experience um, that we refer to as the Ma'afa or the Ma'angamizi, um, more academically known as the transatlantic slave trade. But we don't believe anyone is a slave. People are enslaved. Um, and it should probably be called the European trade, just as referred to the Arab trade in Africans as the Arab slave trade. It really should be the European slave trade, not, not named by the body of water that it crossed, but by the people who perpetuated that crime against humanity. So, And colonialism you know, affects you many ways. The Tainos felt it physically in the practical decimation of their people. Um, but of course, the descendants of enslaved Africans feel it psychologically. They suffer from it economically. Um, because to, 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 for a minority of Europeans to enslave a majority of Africans, um, you know, this is some serious psychological sorcery. You know, as Steve Biko said, the greatest weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the minds of the oppressed. Or as Marcus Garvey said, um, you know, there's an element of mental slavery that comes from several generations of chattel slavery, which dehumanized the African and left him being viewed by society as no better than the cow or pig or horse of someone. Property. Um, to be traded, murdered, abused at the will of its owners. So these things have an effect on generations in terms of our own self-confidence or our own belief in our own humanity. You, you use the term crimes against humanity. Can you just explore those in a bit more detail? Because anybody familiar with um, CARICOM's reparations 10-point plan, they use that term referring to the genocide of the indigenous populations and chattel slavery. So I just wondered if you could explore those themes of crimes against humanity in Jamaica. We, we use that term because by the, by, by the United Nations' own declaration some decades ago, slavery was declared a crime against humanity, meaning it is a crime um, so heinous um, that it is universally accepted to be criminal, right? And um, people have to understand that slavery existed in almost every civilization over time. But the experience of the African was not just slavery as known by the British people under Roman occupation or known by the Jews um, when they were um, enslaved by the Egyptians. But it was a new form of slavery that did not recognize the humanity of the victims and reduce them to what is referred to as chattel, property, that could be bequeathed by the perpetrators of this crime to their successive generations. It is the only form of slavery that enslaved the fetus in the womb of the mother before that child was even born, that child was enslaved. And it's the reason why, as African descendants, we are so quick to refer to our ancestors as slaves. No other people do that, though their ancestors were enslaved at some point by somebody. We are the only ones who have branded it onto our identity. And it is because of the brutal nature of chattel slavery that that psychological effect has taken hold and has been perpetuated by writers and academia for a number of centuries who easily write that, you know, these slaves were traded 
these people were slaves. Um, no, they were enslaved. They were first and foremost human beings who were enslaved. And what of the genocide of the indigenous people? Were they completely wiped out or are there, uh, were there people who survived? Was there any mixing between the Africans and the Taino populations? And how has all this affected modern day um, kind of Jamaican culture today? No, the indigenous people were decimated, but not completely wiped out. Um, their descendants um, are still here, but of course, they, they have mixed with the Africans almost completely. In mm. fact, when I talk about the English invasion of Jamaica when it was a Spanish colony, that particular invasion created some of the, the early African kingdoms in the Americas which is where, as our history teaches us, the Spanish, in withdrawing, um, left their enslaved Africans, who then continued to resist English occupation and took to the mountains where they encountered the last vestiges of the populations of the indigenous people who had been hiding from the Spaniards. Um, and joined with them to learn the landscape, to learn, you know, where, where the rivers ran, um, how to get from east to west and north to south, how to move about the island where food was plentiful. Um, and they infused that into their own regime as they built themselves into a guerrilla force and eventually African kingdoms with their own chiefs and chieftainesses and their own populations that bucked the system and led a war against slavery and colonization by the British and did so so successfully that after a hundred years of fighting, the British were convinced that it was impossible to defeat these people who the Spanish had called Cimarron, meaning untamed and wild, but the, Mar the English had referred to as Maroons. Um, treaties were signed with them in the 1730s um, granting them sovereignty and autonom um, autonomous um, control over the lands that they occupied in the interior of the island. But, you know, this is not unique to Jamaica. There were maroon communities wherever Africans were trafficked and enslaved and were able to resist, to escape, and to link up with the indigenous people who embraced them um, in the struggle against this European domination. So, you know, we have... Quilombos in Brazil, Palenques in Colombia and Venezuela. You know, we had Maroons in Haiti before the Haitian Revolution. You had Maroons almost everywhere. Africans were threatened by the brutality of the institution of slavery and resisted vehemently and vigorously. Um, and in many cases, won our lib liberty and held that liberty within the confines of these sovereign maroon communities. Okay, um, let's touch on some economics then when we're looking at the legacies of British colonization. So uh, is Jamaica still uh, impacted by British colonization in the sense of uh, economics and it's, it's standing in the global uh, economic sphere? That is probably the main way we are impacted. That has been the prize of the European nations, even as they transform their systems of colonial administration from chattel slavery to the quote-unquote apprenticeship period to, 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 you know, being a colony, then into independence, where they have never taken their foot off of the ball is in the arena of economics and thus the greatest obstacle facing African descendants in the Western Hemisphere in these former colonies has been wealth creation and economic independence. The colonies were never designed to give the people economic independence or the ability to create wealth on their own. I mean, just look what happened to Haiti, who violently liberated themselves, declared their own freedom and sovereignty, but yet were blockaded and boycotted by the other nations of the world who refused to recognize their sovereignty and punish them 
for liberating themselves. France even going as far as to claim indemnity, um, forcing Haiti to pay reparation in the amount of the number of enslaved Africans on the island at the time of their liberation and their revolution. And so this has always been the challenge. The way Jamaica has been developed is really just along its coastline. Our industrial systems are designed for extraction, not wealth creation. Hmm. We are a country built on a model of sending our raw materials back to the mother country and then buying the value added final products back from them. And that hasn't changed, not since, not since 1962. And not before that, even going back to the 1730s at the time when, when the Maroons were granted their own sovereignty. You know, the issue of wealth creation and the ability to trade on the global market, um, control of the market is where Europe has always been the gatekeepers and kept the chains tightly wrapped and the locks firmly placed so that even in, in, in liberating ourselves physically, economically they knew that if we were to survive we would have to yield to the dominance of their world and global structure that continues today and it's probably the reason why reparation has become um such a an, an issue now in the 21st century even almost 300 years after the abolition of slavery um because of this economic control that they have kept and and the limited access that they have given to us so sticking with the theme of legacies um we just talked about economics how is jamaica socially still impacted by uh, british colonization oh you pick an arena our children are still learning london bridges falling down in school we're still talking about Mary Mary, quite contrary, and Humpty Dumpty and Baba Black Sheep. That's still in our curriculum, right? Um, white Jesus still proliferates our churches. Um, our constitutional head of state is still the British monarchy, right? So, educationally, we have not decolonized. And if you don't decolonize educationally, then how can you decolonize socially when you inculcate and indoctrinate Jamaicans from such an early stage with a system that is distinctly and overtly or invertly and subconsciously on every level still dominated by white supremacist policies right you can't avoid it um so socially we've internalized the psychological magic that was used to keep africans in chattel slavery we have internalized that so, and, and that's the reason why Europe was able to abolish slavery in that form because the work of putting the chains around our minds had already been done. And that is a much harder thing to remove than the physical shackles, right? So if we're still educating ourselves with a Eurocentric curriculum, if we still speak and dress and act like Europeans, what happens is we begin to practice our own internal racism and so you find in jamaica sayings like you're black like which shows a lack of pride in our own african identity you find a jamaican hardly ready to accept his african identity but is quick to tell you that he is a proud jamaican but if you tell him he's african he will challenge you on that right um we still expect that when we hear about king or queens they must be European. And we have little knowledge of African kings and queens or African royal systems. If it's that we are looking for kings and queens to celebrate and to worship, then why not look to our own?
right? We still learn about Pythagoras. We still have an educational system that glorifies Greco-Roman history. We don't teach our children about Imhotep, the black man who built the first pyramid, right? In Jamaica, when we say Timbuktu, it does not conjure thoughts of the first university city and a seat of learning for African scholars and scholars from around the world, um, a place where Africans studied to the point that they were able to cross the Atlantic 200 years before Columbus, right? Instead, in our minds, when you say Timbuktu, we think you're, you're referring to a place far off um, in the bushes where somebody's gone and lost and may never be found again, right? So I give you those things as an example. What are some of the um, current attitudes towards colonization in Jamaica? What conversations are uh, taking place in the country? You know, the reparations movement has picked up um, much steam um, and is now beginning to, to, you know, come together as a movement after many years and decades of lone voices crying out in the wilderness, um, to use that metaphor. And I think it, it, it's a, as a result of a shift in our attitude towards colonization. So even though, as I said before, there's still those social effects because of our educational system that influence our social practices, because of our political structures that are still hinged to our colored former colonizers. Um, it has been a difficult and long journey for the emancipation of our people's minds, as Marcus Garvey said, right? We're going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery for whilst others have freed our bodies, none but ourselves can free our minds. This none but ourselves part has been a process and it has been a long process. But if you take note over the years and if you look particularly at the reaction of Jamaicans to the visit of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge as they were at the time, now the Prince and Princess of Wales, um, last year, you will see that we are no longer under the spell of the, the hickory dickory duck and the baba black sheep and the, 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 the old nursery rhyme attitude. We're no longer under that spell and Jamaicans are beginning to awaken um, themselves mentally to adjust themselves psychologically and to unburden themselves emotionally of this colonial baggage and to make a final push for our ultimate liberation. So you see our government made announcements of moving towards a republic and finally removing the monarchy as our constitutional head of state. We saw the people gathering in the streets to let the prince and princess of Wales know that they, they, they are not exempt from the call for reparation and reparative justice because they represent an unbroken line um, that was directly involved in the enslavement and trafficking of Africans to Jamaica and to other colonies within the Americas and within the Caribbean. Um, and Jamaica wasn't alone in that. Bahamas joined us. Belize joined us. Um, Barbados is now there. Grenada is there, as you mentioned earlier. CARICOM has put forward a 10-point program. So, you know, I'm saying that the reparation movement encapsulates this shift in our attitude towards British co um, colonialism and colonization. Um, and is indicative of an awakening of the people. And that awakening is going to come with some demands and some repercussions. And so we're happy to be alive and living at that time and to be able to be full participants in that process and that saga. Okay, so we, we've talked about reparations. We, we've touched on it a bit during this, uh, this interview. I want to go into a bit more detail. So what would reparations look like in Jamaica? And what would need to happen for reparations to manifest? 
there's so many areas when we call when we talk about reparative justice you know just last week or the week before the guardian published an article about this process of you know um, melting down metal or iron scrap metal and reforging it um, um don't quote me on, on, on that on the process particularly like but it's called the court process and they did an expose on the fact that the gentleman in britain who patented this process and became quite wealthy discovered the process here in jamaica being done by enslaved and trafficked africans some of them may be even free africans living in jamaica <coughs> like the maroons um, who had been operating in the in the eastern parish of saint thomas and had been working or plying their trade um with a cousin of this gentleman court and not only did they steal this process and claim it as their own by exporting the forge and the entire foundry to britain but they instituted martial law in that parish in jamaica to shut down anybody else practicing that process they claim that they could be used to make weapons for the enslaved. And so they completely shut it down, discontinued it, and did everything to make sure that the knowledge was not passed from one generation to the other. Right? In today's context, you know, you call that industrial espionage and industrial warfare. A man has stolen your patent. A man has robbed you of your intellectual property, claimed it as his own, sold it to the world and created wealth for himself without even giving you a single penny or a drop of recognition or credit, right? They discovered this. So I give that really as an example of how reparation has to work in many areas and many facets. We have to be working with what happened in the past. We also have to be looking at the effects it is having in the present and how we need to address certain things. For example, in Jamaica, there's a statue of Christopher Columbus outside of the Marcus Garvey High School that for years Garveyites and Pan-Africanists have been, have been saying, why is there a statue of Christopher Columbus outside of this Marcus Garvey, this school name for Marcus Garvey? It doesn't look right. It don't feel right. Now, granted, the statue of Columbus was put there because this had happened to be near where he established the first Spanish settlement, right? But the attitude and the awakening of the people now are saying, well, that might be the story, but that's not a story we want to celebrate. There are no statues of us in Spain talking about our contributions, some of which, like the court process out of Britain, we know was stolen, right? So why are we glorifying them when they're not glorifying us? Why are we continuing to, to brainwash ourselves with these images that future generations must see? So the, rep, the, the reparative process, you know, is, is tenfold, maybe even a hundredfold. We've done engagements with the Ministry of Education to, 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 to consult with principals, guidance counselors, and, 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 and senior teachers about changing the narrative in our colonial inherited curriculum, right? And doing things as I've mentioned before. If you're going to teach your children about Pythagoras, you must teach them about Imhotep too. If you're going to teach them about Christopher Columbus, then you must teach them about Mansa Musa also right if you're going to teach them to, about oxford then tell them the real truth of timbuktu right that's one example health wise there are other reasons people are looking at our diet our particular proclivity for hypertension um for for uh, uh, um, obesity for cancer various things that scholars are now linking to nutrition and to the fact that after 300 years of chattel slavery, after five, six generations of starving a people or not caring what you feed them or just feeding them the minimum to stay alive and work, it changes their genetics. It predisposes them to certain things because of the diet they have been accustomed to. Wealth creation is another thing. 
So if you look at the, the CARICOM plan, of course, there's calls for, you know, debt cancellation. There's calls for infusion into technology. There are issues of health. Um, um, reparation, re repatriation is on there for people who would like, for example, for us to travel to Africa right now. We either have to fly through the United States or to fly through Europe. We have to pay a transit fee or a visa fee to those countries to get to our ancestral homeland when our ancestors were kidnapped and taken here. They didn't need any fees. They didn't need any visas. They didn't even want to come here. But yet now for their children to return home, it is a long drawn out process in which we are taxed by the very people who kidnapped our ancestors. There's another example. So when we talk about reparation, there's a broad range of things that we have to touch upon and that we have to address. We need to repair our educational system. We need to repair our economic programs. We need to repair our industrial relationships with these former colonizers, right? We need to repair our healthcare systems, right? There's no paramedic service in Jamaica that when you get into an accident, an ambulance rushes out to tend to you. No, the police have to pick you up and throw you in the back of the car. Sometimes you're dead before you reach the hospital because of being moved and not receiving medical attention where you, where you fell. And for people who were brought here for their physical strength, right? To create wealth for others and did so, so perfectly that Europe was able to save so much. Their consumption was so much less than their, their savings because they weren't paying for the labor that it sparked an industrial revolution and another period of technological enlightenment that they claim to have contributed to the world. But now we are beginning to find out many facets of it were actually stolen from the very labor that they refused to pay. Not only did they refuse to pay them, but they stole their ingenuity, patented it for themselves and continued to create wealth for themselves. And at the point of emancipation or independence, they told us, well, see, you're free now. It's every man for himself. What are you complaining about? Do for yourself. While you're sitting on five, six generations of stolen wealth, that is rightfully the intellectual property of our ancestors. There are many areas that need to be addressed, James. You could do a whole show and we go through each one, right? There are some who are now even linking the Ma'afa, the African Holocaust, with the current climate change crisis that is going on in the world and doing so quite intellectually. And it makes sense if you listen to their arguments. You know, there's an old saying, you know, you reap what you sow. And when you bring destruction, villainy, brutality, rape, murder, theft, <coughs> when that is what you sow, well, what do you expect to reap? Now the earth is calling, the earth is kicking back, and Africa is calling, and the Africans are speaking up. And that brings me to my final question for the interview. Um, so what needs to happen for reparations to manifest? Europe needs to come to the table wholeheartedly and sincerely. We're beginning to see signs of that. For a long time, they refuse even to accept and admit their role and to apologize. The Dutch have been the first. We see the descendants who call themselves the heirs of slavery now um, organizing to, to determine how uh, and how much um, these things are happening. You would not have believed it. 20, decade, um, 20 years ago, two decades ago, you would have thought it was impossible. But we are beginning to see it with our very eyes in this 21st century. And so I think what needs to happen on our side is that our governments need to continue now to begin to address this seriously from a governmental perspective and a governmental policy. We never had a reparative policy from our independence. That was always lacking. We never went about, we were so happy to have received 
our independence, our freedom, our right to vote, our right to govern ourselves, that we were just, okay, forward march. We didn't stop to say, well, now that we are free, we need to look at some of the terrible things, some of the inhumane, some of the criminal things that were done to us that leaves us at a deficit to start off from. And we need some redress on that. That was never seriously considered at, at the time when we were crafting our constitution and moving into independence. But now with the steam that the reparation movement is picking up, governments are beginning to take it seriously. Councils are being formed, policies are being drafted. Um, CARICOM some years ago sent letters to the European nations demanding an apology. That was in 2008. And you see it took 15 years after that for the first European government, the Dutch government, to make their apology. And I hear and suspect that the Portuguese will follow suit shortly, right? And so once that begins to happen, you're going to see a domino effect amongst those nations. What we have to be careful is not to allow them to control the narrative as they did in the time of abolition. They sell the world as if abolition was their idea and that out of their own humanity, they, they decided to abolish slavery. Nothing is further from the truth. Slavery was abolished because of the resistance and the fight put up by Africans, not just in the, on the fields, in the mountains and on the plantations, but the lobbying that was done by former enslaved and now free Africans in places like Westminster. People like Oluwada Equiano, who brought it to the attention of young British parliamentarians who thought they could build a career out of crusading for abolition. They didn't just wake up in their bed and say, oh, it's a terrible thing we're doing to these Africans. We should set them free because this is not Christian and we say we're Christians. That, that was never the process. We had to show them the horrors that were being perpetrated against our people. And it started with the Zong massacre. And even after, even after petitioning them, petitioning them from as early as the 1780s, it took two decades for them to end the slave trade and three more decades for them to abolish slavery itself as an institution. So when you look at what we're doing with reparation, don't be surprised. As I said, 2008, we CARICOM's demanded apologies. Everybody resisted in 2023. The Dutch became the first to issue one. So we might have to wait another three decades. It might be my children or my grandchildren who are going to finish this fight. But what I can guarantee you is that we are going to so educate them, teach them, and let them understand that they are in, a, in the final moments of a war that was begun by their ancestors three, four hundred years ago on those slave ships, but will end with them, right? In the hallowed halls of these world bodies and organizations um, that claim to exist to defend the humanity of all. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's been a fascinating interview. I've really enjoyed um, going through some of these uh, themes, the, the history, um, the, the case for reparations. And I felt it was very important that you um, approach reparations from uh, the various facets, repatriation, uh, rebuilding the economy, debt cancellation, because you often hear people reducing the idea of reparations to just a cash payment. Uh, and in some way that cheapens the debate. Cash Cash go cash have to happen too. Precisely. Uh, I suppose the, 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 the funding would be required for the reparations to take place, but it's about stimulating healing and repair, yeah. not just a, a one off pay up, a, a one uh, a kind of lump sum. Yes. Uh, I'll tell you one thing, James. For 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 and this this is just such a great example to show the imbalance in the system. Being a former British colony, right? Jamaica. If I want to travel to the UK, I have to apply for a visa. This is my former mother country where their monarchy is still legally my head of state. So for me to visit my king, I have to apply for a visa and go through a, like a selection process. And I have to pay for this process. Money, cash. I got to pay cash for this process. And there's no guarantee that I will be granted a visa. And in the case that I am not granted a visa, the cash that I pay 
to go through the process of this of rejection is not returned to me so when you talk about is there going to be cash payments there various areas of reparations that were going to be coming for some cash back that mm -hmm. is an example of one mm -hmm. thousands hundreds millions of dollars collected from jamaica's over jamaicans over the last 20 years who did not get no visa to travel to the uk but that money was added to the pockets of the british economy we want it back and we will accept the cash payments for that right so whether that money can be put towards repatriation or however it's going to be done it has to be done so i understand people are saying you know and they downplay oh everybody just wants a check or this or that no it's not just about a check but there's nothing wrong with a check either but a check is only a part of the bigger equation right because every plantation owner at abolition got a check mm. nobody was saying to them well, oh this cash how is it going to work they worked it out how many africans did you enslave they had a calculation here's your money sir this is what we are paying you for raping murdering and 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 enslaving babies in the wombs of their mothers here is your cash payment for that so yeah we are entitled to a cash payment too and at, at the minimum amount it should be no less than what they were paid for the souls of our ancestors Thank you very much for clarifying, Stephen. And, and where can people get in touch with you, uh, contact you if they're interested in, in supporting the important work that you're doing? Please follow the CARICOM Reparations Commission um, on social media, CARICOM Reparations, um, uh, um, CARICOMREPARATIONS.ORG. There's also the National Council of Reparations for Jamaica, um, which is NCR Jamaica. Um, for me personally, they can follow us at UNIA, UNIA Jamaica, one word. That's our so social media handle um, on Instagram, on Facebook. But just Google UNIA Jamaica, um, CARICOM Reparations, National Council of Reparations for Jamaica, um, and they'll find us. Thank you. And equally, um, you can follow the Association of Former British Colonies on Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, where you can see um, some of the interviews and the live events that we've done. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Um, this will be uploaded to uh, YouTube uh, and various other uh, social media channels. Um, so we hope that you find this useful. And if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the uh, comment section or you can email myself or contact uh, Stephen uh, as per the uh, social media handles mentioned previously. Um, thank you for listening, everyone, and thank you, Stephen. Thanks for having me, James, and keep up the good work, my brother. Aluta continua.